Hello viewers, it's James Common and we are here at the Guggenheim and yes, we're going to take a stroll through the Hilma Alfklint show paintings for the future. This is maybe one of the most important and significant shows in the last 10 years here in New York and it uh, brings up some interesting questions, not the least of which is who actually invented abstraction? Well, we, before we get started, I'd like to recommend a couple of books. First, the catalog for this, which is published by the Guggenheim and features some brilliant essays by Tracy Bashkoff and a conference of artists, contemporary artists discussing Hilma Alf Klint and some other recently found research on her that was very interesting. And also, I'm going to link this stuff all below. This is another catalog that was put out by the Moderna Musit in Stockholm. And this is even more inclusive. But uh, if you're interested in Hilma Alfklint, uh, either one of these books would be a good place to start doing your research on her. And I think this one actually probably has a lot of work that was not sent to New York. And I'm probably going to try to link some other maybe YouTube videos and other things below, so uh, take a look at uh, the stuff on the down page. This is from the wall text. When Hilma Alfklint began creating radically abstract paintings in 1906 in Stockholm, they were little like that had been seen before, bold, colorful, and untethered from recognizable references to the physical world. It was years before Valsi Kandinsky, Piet Mondrian, and others would take similar strides to rid their own artwork of rep representational content. Yet while many of her better-known contemporaries published manifestos and exhibited widely, Alfklint kept her groundbreaking paintings largely private. She rarely exhibited them, and convinced the world was not yet ready to understand her work, stipulated that they not be shown for 40 years following her death. Ultimately, her abstractions remained all but unseen until 1986, 80 years after she began her monumental cycle, The Paintings for the Temple, 1906 to 15. At the outset of her career in the late 1880s, Alfklin pursued a more traditional artistic path and established herself as a respected landscape and portrait painter in Stockholm. She also became involved in a range of religious and occult teachings, including spiritualism, theosophy, and Rosicrucianism. These two defining commitments, art and spirituality, remained separate until 1906, when Alfklit began the paintings for the temple. The artworks that marked her pivotal break with figuration and her turn towards spiritual subject matter. She attributed the origins of these paintings in part to spirits that she channeled and drew upon her own metaphysical convictions as she sought to represent a transcendent reality beyond the observable world. By 1915, when Alf Klitt completed this project, it consisted of 193 paintings and works on paper. The artist imagined installing the cycle in a multi-level temple connected by a spiral path, a design with strong, though coincidental, echoes of Guggenheim's own Frank Lloyd Wright design building itself conceived as a temple of spirit. Over the next decades until her death in 1944, Alfklint continued to push the boundaries of her new abstract vocabulary and spiritually derived subjects as she experimented with form, theme, and seriality. Alfklint's decision to reserve her work for a future audience makes, it makes its contemporary reception a fulfillment of the artist's wishes and a rare opportunity to rethink art history. Her achievements now call into question the standard narrative of abstraction's development in the early 20th century, demanding a reevaluation of its timeline and key figures, as well as of the factors that shaped its trajectory, including geography, gender, and broader currents in intellectual and visual culture. The present exhibition, which focuses on Alf Klint's breakthrough years, constitutes a crucial step in amending that story. 
In this new light, Alf Klint emerges as an artist both of her time and decisively ahead of it. Well, this is the first gallery, <clears throat> it's a little out of sequence. These are ten large pieces called the Ten Largest. These are magnificent paintings, large scale. And I believe these were done over, get this, a 40 day period by Hilma. Uh, as we get along farther in this, I'll talk a little bit about some of her history. This piece is titled Old Age. And I believe that all of these are paper mounted on canvas. And this represents a life cycle, so this would be the last, this would be number 10. Now, Hilma is uh, of a mythical painter. She was Swedish, born in 1862 in Stockholm, and she came from a family of naval officers who were known for their naval architecture and also astronomical navigation techniques, and they, her great-grandfather, I think, wrote some books on that. Hilma was also one of the first generation of female artists that was allowed to study at the Royal Academy of Art. As we go along, I'll talk a little bit more about this. Hilma actually has a vocabulary of various shapes, forms, even letters. She believed that she was in contact with uh, spirits from a higher level of consciousness, somehow? Let me read a little bit from the Tracy Bashkoff essay. By 1896, Alfklint was meeting regularly with a group of four women to conduct seances and pursue a meaningful spiritual path. Anna Cassell, Alfklint's friend from the Royal Academy, Cornelia Seiderberg, Sigrid Hedman, and Matilda N., whose surname is unknown, the activities of the five de femme, as they, were, as they called themselves, would profoundly impact Alfklint's artic artistic practice. Weekly meetings took place at their homes in the studios of the members and were structured not unlike a traditional church service to include Bible readings, sermons, and benedictions. Furniture was arranged so that the participants knelt around an altar. The five believed that they were communicating and receiving messages from beings of higher consciousness by entering trance states or using a psychograph, a tool used to record psychic transmissions. The guides, or higher masters, the Hoge, identified themselves as Ameliel, Ananda, Clemens, Esther, Georg, and Gregor, and led the group into their spiritual trainings as the women ventured beyond their external reality into realms of the unseen. Well, there were a lot of spiritualistic things that were happening around this time, so we're talking the 1890s, early 20th century. One of the other important influences was Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophists. Um, Rudolf Steiner, we'll probably talk about him later, also played a pivotal role in influencing Alf Klint. And I think also the other interesting question is how does Alf Klint and her, this was a separate practice from her academic painting, how does this fit into the whole idea of abstraction? Who came first, who came last? Uh, was she really making abstract paintings 10 years before Kandinsky and Mondrian? Um, I would say that this exhibition is probably pretty good proof that she was. But it also, by answering those questions, it opens up a whole basket of other questions. Okay, so I believe this one is the large, one of the large tens. This is number two, which is childhood. You know, she has a wonderful uh, palette, and I really appreciated the way these look. Now, if you kind of close in on this section, 
They were saying that part of this, a lot of this was painted on the floor, but at some point she must have stood them up because you could see the way the drips are running. But also there's a certain urgency and uh, kind of intent to get these finished. So she's kind of splashing things around. It's almost uh, kind of reminiscent of, dare I say, abstract expressionism. You know, she was not finically. Also, yeah, she's got some kind of psychic text and I find this interesting because the text, the lines from the text kind of switches from, okay, there's our spermazoa. It switches from being a text into being a vine of a flower into being the tail of a spermazoa. So as far as kind of combining those relationships of text and image, uh, compositional forms all together, she does an incredible job. People in New York, at least the painters, have been dying for a show like this since 1987. And, uh, well, Alf Klint has an incredible story. So she was also doing a uh, kind of straight commercial academic painting. She specialized in portraiture, landscapes. Oh, everybody's got to take their selfies. Anyway, this shows you, this is the the first gallery at the bottom of the ramp at the Guggenheim and in certain ways I think that this exhibition and the Guggenheim Museum were almost designed for each other. Evidently most of these pieces were not shown during her lifetime and even to the other friends in this well what's been referred to as a coven of her her uh, female friends that had were doing the seances and stuff she didn't show this work to a lot of them it's amazing that she would do that much work and not want to show it. These are examples of her academic work. She was actually a professional academic painter specializing in portraiture landscape and you can see that she really is very talented and I think her botanical studies, some of these are fantastic. Uh, there's a nice portrait. They were comparing her to Kandinsky and Mondrian and I'll tell you I've seen <laughs> some of Kandinsky and Mondrian's portraits or their realism and she's I think more competent Now this is an example of her I guess what you would call her academic commercial work. This is the kind of work that she was doing and supporting herself She was actually uh, given a studio in a in a building in downtown Stockholm where they had a gallery on the first floor and um, she had her little crew there. This is an interesting drawing. This is actually a collaborative drawing by the five and I really like this because I'm a big fan of outsider art and that made me kind of think about some of the outsiders. Also when you start to think about the idea of abstract art, something like this. It's very interesting. Now it says that Helma started attending these seances and then about a year later her younger sister died at the age of about 18. And at some point she became more involved and more active in the seances and became more involved in the, the actual the creation of the works. Those are wonderful. These are also collaborative drawings. These are the collective works of the five. You know, she, she works a lot in series and each one of the series are numbered and so it's very interesting to see how things kind of progress. You know, and there are references here. I think this is untitled. 1908. Dry pastel and graphite on paper. Looks like uh, wrapping paper.
Well, there was a very big trend in the 1880s, 1890s of people getting involved in spiritualism. Okay, these are from the, the W.U. Rowe series. These are some of the first, what I would call, serious paintings. They're not that big. They're probably about uh, 20 by 16. But right off the bat, you start to see how there are images that you'll return to again and again. One of them is kind of the spiral or the snail shell like that. Also, you can see that these are a little, a little more brushy, a little more expressionistic. I think the flower is a big symbol for her. She also has a um, kind of a code of colors where she saw the the male as yellow, the female as blue, and then the green was the conjunction of those two forces. It's a beautiful little series. Those are from 1908. more of the Rose series. I like that one. And that's got regular text. I don't read Swedish, but she has a uh, you know, a secret or a mystical text that she uses. One of the symbols is there is the U and the W. The U represents the spiritual world. The double W is the material world. Well, I guess at some point about this time, 1907-1908, one, one of the guides said that one of these five women was going to start the great work. And I think that they were talking about creating a series of what you call illustrations depicting the spiritual world, but they were designing them for a temple. So, I believe there was a series of 190 paintings called the Paintings for the Temple. All of the works, I guess, in this show are from that series. Most of them are between the years of 1905 and 1922 or 23. This is the erotic series. Group 2. This is number 2. Oil on canvas. This is number five, group two number five. Now you can see that she is starting to, well, her guides are starting to use a very typical palette, although it is beautiful. And again, I look at this stuff and I think this looks so contemporary. Also, she's got a wonderful touch, and if you were to compare this, and, and I'm kind of sad that they didn't put more of her academic work in there so we could get a much better contrast of how this uh, kind of spiritual guided work differs from her academic commercial work. These are the Seven Pointed Star series. Temper and graphite on paper. She's got an incredible line. Also, despite the fact that they're talking about her being isolated and living in Sweden and kind of in her little group, Oh, and that's interesting. See the little eyelets there at the top of this piece? So they're saying that this stuff wasn't shown, but I'm thinking if you've got eyelets like that, that was put onto that piece so you could hang it on the wall. So I would think that that piece was at least hung on the wall, displayed somewhere.
she produced hundreds of these notebooks. As I said, she was the daughter of a, from a family of naval officers, and I <laughs> kind of believe that they knew how to run a tight ship and keep records of a lot of things, and uh, everything had a place and everything is in its place, and they ran a very tight ship. This is from the Evolution series. This is group six, evolution number seven. You know, I was looking at this earlier and thinking that her pinks and her blacks make me think of, there was a whole series that Mary Heilman did in kind of pinks and blacks and grays. This is from the Seven Pointed Star series, group six. Evolution number eight. And again, you know, there are things that she's doing in here, like this little curly Q squiggly things with the little, I don't know what you'd call those, spermazoa forms, some kind of little plant with tail forms. Also, I find this stuff fascinating, the little notations around the edges. Now, it said, it was said that she, and there we have our eyelets again, so it makes me think that this was hum, somehow hung somewhere for display. They're talking about this work was kept secret, and in one of her notebooks she stipulated that she didn't want any of her work to be exhibited until 20 years after she was dead. And Evidently, even, I guess, her nephew inherited her oeuvre, her body of work, and when he presented it to the people at the museum, I think in 1964 at the National Museum in Stockholm, they wouldn't even talk to him. He just thought, oh my God, this is a crazy lady, and we're not going to take the time to deal with this. Okay, this is the WUS seven pointed star series this is group five evolution number 13 now I think it's interesting that she's starting to bring in uh, kind of figure development you've got these weird figures on the side you've got the Otoboro the snake eating its own tail you've got the swans this is evolution number 14 oil on canvas 99.5 by 129.5 centimeters. So we've got little figures in there. It's like the double horses. And I guess if you would go through the notebooks, which there are several scholars now that are analyzing and, and looking at her notebooks, trying to figure out her language, you could start to decipher some of the the meanings that she's putting across. Uh, as someone that is not initiated in that language, though, you can just look at that painting and say, damn, that's just interesting as heck, and I, <laughs> I wonder what it all means. I think that's one of the questions that this brings up, is how much of this do you actually have to understand to appreciate it aesthetically? This is one of my favorite pieces. This is also from the Seven Pointed Star series, Group 6, Evolution number 15. You know, she's got a lot of different kinds of symbols. She's got astrological symbols. She's got her strange kind of hermetic text. We get in there and look at some of the paint handling. Now, they're talking about her being kind of isolated, although there's some new research that's come out since this show was planned that says that she actually traveled around a little bit more than they thought and evidently at one point as I said she was in a studio building that had a gallery on the ground floor and Edvard Munch was exhibited there there's no evidence that she ever met him but I wouldn't be surprised if she saw the work 
and in a certain way just as a painter I'm looking at the surfaces on some of these and this is why I'd like to see more of academic work you can see the difference in the kind of the lightness of the application of the paint this is this is not like academic painting where you have to have a certain um, cuisine a certain thickness a certain surface a certain finish that was required from academic work this is all very spontaneous very urgent and you can see kind of some of the <laughs> some of the fudges which I like also you can see the pencil lines under this and when you see some of the forms that she repeats again and again you realize that probably growing up in the house with a bunch of uh, naval officers who specialized in navigating she uh, had a lot of access to rulers, compasses, all kinds of mechanical drawing devices and probably from an early age was taught Euclidean geometry. This is actually a wonderful series of watercolors. This is the tree of knowledge. This is number one. And well you can see that there's some metallic paint in there. These are watercolor and graphite on paper. But they're wonderfully articulate And I guess that not only was she selling portraits and landscapes, but a lot of uh, her commercial work was done doing these botanical studies. And the kind of wonderful detail and just great watercolor technique that she uses is so apparent in this particular series. So these, something about the scale and the imagery is very nice. And there's a lot of stuff going on there. So she's got her swans, <laughs> which is a symbol that we'll get to in a few paintings down the line. Tree of Knowledge number five. And I love the way that she kind of, in some of her pieces, she insets these kind of a discordant little section that kind of apparently, at least for me, doesn't seem to have any relationship to anything else, but it's just kind of set in there. This is from the Swan series. This is Group 9, SUW, the Swan number 1, oil on canvas. 160 by 193 centimeters. Well, now she's bringing in her naturalism, her realism, and using it in a symbolic way. You can see I was saying that she had traveled around and been a little more exposed to contemporary ideas than a lot of people thought before. And I think there's also a lot of Art Nouveau influences. This is the Swan number seven. I'm also thinking, you know, it'd be really easy for her to slip into some kind of kitsch but there's a kind of a brevity to the a lot of the work. Okay, we're going to close in. So, and I was talking about her kind of the light touch, the washy surface use of the oil paints, which actually makes me think of what Edvard Munch was, how he was painting about the same time. Okay, those are swans, but those are not those are not cutesy swans. 
And a lot of this is, again, dealing with her ideas of duality. A lot of the work is dealing with duality. Also, pay attention to the lines. Each part of that, those lines that dissect that canvas are a different color, and evidently there's a different meaning to each one of the colors. This is the swan number nine. becoming more straight abstract although you can't help but look at these pieces and wonder what what the cubes mean floating down these kind of spiral horn shapes that circular shape with the little dots in there appears in three or four other paintings uh, if you're interested I did a show of or did a program of her work at the new museum that appeared a couple years ago and I believe this painting might have been in that show. Also, I'm thinking that might be metallic paint, the what looks like yellow ochre now, but at the time, that might have been some kind of shiny, brassy, or gold metallic paint. So as I was saying, I was wondering whether these pieces were unstretched and rolled up for storage for 70 or 80 years, or whether they were stretched while she was alive and that she was aware of how these things all looked when they were prepared. This is the swan number 10. Oil on canvas 152 by 169 centimeters. Again we've got this strange circular forms. I was talking about the fact that she really, in a lot of these works, she kind of breaks a lot of rules. Well, <laughs> maybe they're the, the bad rules that I learned as a painter coming to New York. One of the, one of the rules was that if you're going to work on a certain scale, that everything has to relate to the scale. She would work on something, which I would consider this a fairly, not a huge painting, but a large painting, so it's about probably four and a half by five and a half feet, something like that. But then she's got these little little dots, little things floating around in them. This is SUW-UW series, Group 9, The Swan, number 11. Also, in this particular piece, it seems like she's left a lot of very lightly painted raw linen. There's a certain delicacy about a lot of her brushwork that's just exquisite. And then when she wants to make a statement, she can focus right in there and build up her pigments and colors in such a nice, strong contrast. She knows exactly what she's doing as far as using that paint to capture your attention. Again, here is another that she uses the, the square divided into four squares. And in a lot of ways that predates a lot of the Russian constructivists. But it's the same kind of purified, almost Euclidean approach to the picture plane. This is the swan number 12. And this is the swan number 13. Okay, we've got a very simple composition. We've got the rectangle of the picture plane. We've got a circle. We've got two triangles. Again, look at the color lines. great with her fades coming out of the center. And as I said, even these areas that are these black or monochrome flat planes, there's a lot of stuff going on in them. This is the swan number 14. 
again, superficially this looks very simple and when you get up and take a closer look you see there's a lot of stuff going on there. She's got her primary colors sort of beaming out of the center of that circle. This is the swan number 15. At some point, Rudolf Steiner came by her studio. This was in 1908, 1909, after she'd been working frantically on these paintings for the temple and evidently he saw the work and uh, had kind of a negative response. One of the things was he didn't like the idea of spiritualism. He didn't like the idea that people were trying to contact these beings from a higher level somehow. This is one of my favorite, this, these next two pieces are a couple of my favorite pieces. This is the swan number 16. Now, as I was saying, she's breaking the rules. She's got this nice, beautiful, very austere, simple form, almost minimalistic. And then right in the middle, she's got a tiny little triangle. Anyway, Rudolf Steiner kind of put a kibosh on her and it uh, it bummed her out so much that she stopped painting, stopped working on this series of paintings for the temple for four years. And then when she came back and started working again, she decided that she wasn't going to say that she was being guided by some kind of beings from another plane of consciousness but I guess it was more looking inside and just making these paintings based on her own self-examination and exploration of her own psyche somehow yeah this would be a painting that I would love to have myself And, yeah, there is something about the way that she balances her colors that's its just beautiful. I, <laughs> I always believe that some people, maybe they're not inspired by higher beings, but some people just have a natural ability. They're born in some kind of a state of grace that they can do something like mix those colors in just the right proportion. This is the swan number 22. Now again, there are things about this that I like. Part of this is the restraint. You've got these very hard-edged geometric forms. A lot of this is very, very lightly painted. I'm almost thinking that she wanted to leave it with the sense of raw canvas. And then other parts are very emphatically and very substantially painted. Oh, there's our little fudge. And I believe that this, again, is metallic paint. Well, Hilma died in 1944. I think she was 82, something like that, in a streetcar accident. And at that point, as I said, she'd left instructions that her work should not be shown for 20 years and I guess she left it to her nephew so a lot of this work was stored in an unheated attic in crates this is the swan number 23 Okay, here we can actually see where she is contrasting some impasto. 
against a very thinly painted ground. If you spend a little time just looking at the lines and seeing where she doubles lines, triples lines, uh, one color runs along part of the line and then it stops. This is all amazingly sophisticated stuff and you realize that she really is spending a lot of time thinking about this, the colors of all the lines, the symmetry. Okay, this is kind of a uh, second part to the ten largest. These are three pieces known as the altar pieces. This is number one, altar piece 1915, oil and metal leaf on canvas. 237 by 179 centimeters. I think these might be some of the most reproduced of her paintings. Again, just you know, beautiful brushwork. So I'm thinking it would have been wonderful to see these before the the metal leaf tarnished and kind of lost a lot of its shine. I was looking at this, see this little oval and the way that it sort of steps down and changes from a flattened out oval into a circle and then becomes flattened out in the other way. This is all done through geometric mathematical progressions and you know that she's a very uh, intelligent and very competent geometrician when she can do a, a procedure like that. This is number three altarpiece 1915. Now they talk about this as metal leaf as opposed to gold leaf and I'm thinking if it would have been gold leaf it probably would have held up better Although it does have a wonderful kind of patina of, of age. And yeah, you wouldn't want to restore that because that would sort of upset the entire uh, sense of the kind of the aged quality of all these pieces. This is altarpiece number two. 138 by 179 millimeters. So if the 10 largest would be the pieces that you would come into the temple and look at, these would be the pieces at the top of the temple. And they were also talking about the fact that the Guggenheim Museum in a lot of ways was designed almost in accordance with sketches and ideas that uh, Hilma Alfklint had laid out in the 20s and 30s about what her temple, the place that she wanted to display these works, would look like. And the Guggenheim was organized by Solomon R. Guggenheim and his consultant Hilla Raby. And Hilla was of course deeply involved in spiritualism. She was a big, big fan, an acolyte of Kandinsky. And so it makes this even more fitting that these works are shown here. This is Dove number one, oil on canvas, 151 by 114 centimeters. Again, you look at this, there's a double helix here in the middle, and this is it's about 50 years before Cricks and the other guy <laughs> discovered DNA. And I'm kind of a agnostic when it comes to the whole idea of spiritualism, but I do understand that somehow there are things happening out there in the world of pure forms or in people's minds that we don't totally understand and there are relationships and patterns that seem to repeat themselves. This is group nine. UW, the Dove number three, 
1915. Now also I think it's interesting to see where she kind of, she melds, there's a certain flatness that you have with the diagrammatic work. And then when she's able to meld the, kind of the flatness of the diagrammatic into a three-dimensional thing is interesting. Okay, and this is kind of funny. I know we've got a little dove that's kind of wrapped around this twined line here. Oh, there's Stephen Westfall. I thought these two paintings were especially nice, very simple. They're almost like something you would see on a fresco in Pompeii. This is Group 9, UW the Dove, number 12. 159 by 129 centimeters. There's a Taurus. Gemini and again she's using silver paint and a lot of people thought that Pollock was the first guy to use a lot of silver radiator paint and it's interesting to see how that's held up but I do like the uh, the variegation that has come with the age on that This is the dove number 13. Okay, we got Leo, I don't know what that is. Aquarius. This is Virgo. And this is interesting because she's distinguished between a kind of a bronze metallic and a gold or brass metallic. And okay, I think the other painting had male angels and those look like female angels. Well, you've got one with blue wings and one with yellow wings so maybe there's one of each. But just an incredibly simple composition but beautiful. Evidently she also created these books. Uh, people were saying that she didn't really expose the work a lot but the way that she was able to get it out was that she would do these books, do, do photographs and then do color, watercolor reproductions of the work so people could see the the colors. This is the Dove number 14. Now evidently there was something like 190 or 200 paintings in the paintings for the temple. So this is not the entire collection but I think it's enough to give you an example of how the series worked. I think this was interesting the way that this one edge is unpainted and leaves the raw linen visible. Also, I think it would be worthwhile to kind of consider how Helma relates to outsider art, just in general. I think. Uh, Roger Cardinal in his book Outsider Art where he kind of took over from Jean Dubuffet talking about Art Brut makes a couple of additional categories one of them is the visionary I think Dubuffet just wanted anybody that was untouched by culture uh, Cardinal kind of includes other ones and one of them is a visionary or an you see an artist that is in touch with other sources. And then at some point, and I think this might also relate to her meetings or something with Rudolf Steiner, she started doing just watercolors. She received her initial commission from the from the guides when she was 43. So later, 
you're just going to, you know, if you're 55 or 60, you're not going to have the same energy. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if she'd uh, probably run through a lot of money and probably didn't have the kind of support that would be required to keep doing the same type of work. But these watercolors are fantastic. I like the little, so we've got the little squares. And within that square, the colors are very vibrant and bright and intense. And then as it, the image drifts off, off the square, it becomes kind of faded. And In certain ways, uh, these late works with the watercolors are even more austere, more geometric. These are the parser file series. Number 112. This is number 114. And yeah, this is not that far removed from what Melovich was doing about the same time. These are more of the Parsifal series. That was number 117. This is number 120. number 121. Oh, this is a great series. I actually initially looked at this and it made me think of Ellsworth Kelly. Or the Parser Falls series. Number 60. She was very regimented in a lot of ways. <laughs> and yeah. if you're interested, you should zoom in and look at the text. It's number 62. These large square fields with a tiny, tiny dot, and it does make me think of the beginning of Euclidean geometry where the beginning is the dot and then the line and then the triangle and then the square. Very sensitive. I think this is an example of one of her, kind of a mixture of her botanical studies with the spiritual symbolism, but you can see that she is, really, she's an extraordinary watercolorist and draftsman, and her handwriting is beautiful. And this is mysterious. You know, they were talking about her knowledge of plants more beautiful naturalism. Talk about our knowledge of plants and these the fact that these ladies were getting together and having these seances and things. And I was wondering if there might be some kind of native psychotropic plants that they might have been sampling or playing with. This is the Adam series. This is Adam number one. This is 1917. This is an interesting piece. So we've got the square broken down into the quadrants. And then 
this lower right hand corner's got the ragged edges on there. You know, and I'm thinking maybe if you don't have enough energy or money or materials to make paintings, you could make these notes and you could very easily convert them into paintings at some point. This is also a very beautiful series. This is titled Series 2, The Starting Picture. Oil on canvas, 27 by 36. And if you were to compare this to the imagery in the 10 largest, or even some of the other ones, this is even more austere. Also, as I was looking at this, they call this oil on canvas, but it's a very fine canvas. I'm almost thinking it's like muslin. Very beautiful. And I like her little sections of text that she writes in there. This is number 30. The Mohammedan standpoint. Also an interesting piece. The teachings of Buddhism. Christian religion. It's a beautiful little series. Also, this is wonderful. This is titled Series 5. And yes, you can get in there and look at the little details, the the little rectangles with the little edges of black and white. She has a particular format, she kind of sticks with it, but within that format there's such a great variations that she's playing with. Again, we've got our metallic paint, our symbols. I can't help but look at a color red like that and think of Hilma Aufklint somehow. These are all from 1920. So I think at this point, she's kind of lost her energy, or maybe she's, as I said, you never know what kind of personal issues people can be dealing with. Family responsibilities, illness, economic problems. But still, the work is wonderful, it's imaginative. A lot of the minimalists work in these kinds of series and she definitely was very disciplined and very structured in her progressions. This is series number four. This is number 20, 1920. Yeah, I look at this and I wonder what these kind of, what the text says, what the kind of pinched rectangles mean, little dots that are sort of floating there.
and these are all, like I said, on this raw, very fine canvas. I like the, the halo of the, the linseed oil as it bleeds out from her paint. This is the final series of watercolors. In a way, I think because of the the use of uh, the absorption of the paper, the water, the kind of uncontrollable nature of working with this kind of medium, she's exploring different aspects of her spiritual uh, investigation. And even if there might not be as ambitious scale-wise as some of the other works, I think that these are also interesting and you could scale these up fairly easily and have some very nice interesting paintings. Okay, here is our final suite of works. These are from 1931. It's untitled. If you spend time, you can almost look in there and see little figures or angels or things floating around. Now, I wouldn't want to overstate it, but you could almost say that this is a forerunner of the stain painting that was being done in New York about 40 years later. This is untitled, 1931. Untitled 1931, watercolor on paper, 35 by 26. Okay, so that was it. Well, you've made it to the top of the ramp with James Com, and we've been reporting on Hilma Alf Klint paintings for the future here at the Guggenheim Museum. You can like this, subscribe recommend it to your friends, and you can leave your ideas, thoughts, criticisms, critiques, reviews, and suggestions below, but especially with these long versions, we ask you to say, thank you, Kate. <laughs>